Good morning. How's everybody this morning? Everybody good? I love when the weather turns positive here in the Washington area. I remember many a snowstorm here, so uh, it's glad to see summer here already. So welcome and thank you for having me. Um, what a great honor it is to be here. Very humbled and uh, just a huge appreciation for from CSIS for hosting us and uh, having us uh, have an opportunity to talk today. So I want to I want to spend a few moments and maybe um, talk about the state of cybersecurity and uh, maybe a couple of uh, ideas on how we can improve things in the world. Uh, I get a pretty unique perspective, um, as Jim said. I was a CEO of McAfee for quite a few years. Um, on Delta Airlines' board and do safety and security for the airline. Um, chairman and CEO of FireEye. I'm also chairman of Mandiant as well. So kind of a number of different viewpoints in the world. And uh, it's been interesting, to say the least. And um, I probably use a, a quote to probably summarize it best. And uh, many of you probably know this quote. It was made famous in 1966 by Robert Kennedy during the uh, Bay of Pig crisis, um, the Cuban-Russian Bay of Pig crisis. And uh, the words are, may you live in interesting times. And uh, some of you may know it, and actually have its origins all the way back to China. And um, while sounding like a positive statement, it has uh, got an undertone to it too, which is a bit of a curse. And may you live in interesting times is kind of what we, we see in the world today from a cyber, cyber point of view. What a, what a world we live in. And um, watching it over the last decade has been uh, fascinating to me to see sort of what's been going on and the severity levels that are, that are happening. And uh, I call it a perfect storm for, for a number of reasons. And uh, if you think about it, uh, we have almost the perfect confluence of conditions happening in the world today that has created an atmosphere for crime and, and theft in the world of cyber and cyberspace. And probably the first is one of the most positive things, hence the, hence the words may live in interesting times, is innovation. We have some of the greatest cycles of innovation the world has ever seen, and that is amazing. Well, we literally are reimagining everything we've been doing. The internet has created an atmosphere that allows us to, uh, to do so many things different. How we read, how we learn, how we share, how we uh, listen, just about everything we do has changed for the better probably, and differently. And this innovation is, uh, is creating a, an unbelievable, unbelievable cycle of architectural changes in companies and entities and governments around the world. Just think about what's happened in the world of mobile, IT consumerization. How many of you have more than one cell phone? How many of you have more than two cell phones? How many have more than one device? The world we live in has changed dramatically and corporations are having a hard time adopting to those types of changes. But again, we're changing everything we do. Think about uh, SaaS-based architectures and clouds, software as a service. The acceleration of innovation in enterprises is dramatic. We're seeing software as a service having you know, some of the greatest uh, momentum uh, probably ever and having the biggest architectural changes and ever. We have private clouds, we have public clouds, we have hybrid clouds. Uh, we have uh, companies going public uh, almost every day now that are software as a service type architectures. Some of you probably saw Tableau and um, Marketo go public just on Friday. Salesforce.com, Oracles of the world, Jives of the world. It's amazing to watch how much infrastructure today is a radically new architecture. Compound that with social. Everybody's probably here on a social network or two or three or five. And uh, we are living in a whole new world with social networks basically exposing every friend you have, every professional you've been associated with, anybody you've ever met in your entire lifetime is there for, for, the, for the watching and for the, uh, for the observation. And uh, what's that created? It's created an unbelievable scenario of vulnerabilities. And that's pretty much what sort of the next variable is, is the, uh, the greed variable. And it's amazing to me to watch this because in all my time, I've never seen the state of things be as, as aggressive they are in the areas of greed. So innovation has driven the opposite effect or the curse effect, which is everybody seeks that innovation. That intellectual property that's being created at unbelievable rates is creating the theft of that intellectual property at unbelievable rates. And you watch both sides of that coin the same way, and we're seeing unparalleled 
absolutely unparalleled theft in the world today. And uh, it's amazing to watch happen. Compound that with privacy and anonymity on the internet and the ability to protect your information, the ability to stay anonymous with who you are has created a perfect storm again to steal that innovation because I can basically hide behind that privacy, hide behind that anonymity, and I can create an atmosphere where I can steal almost, uh, almost at will. Put on top of that, a lack of governance on the internet. Again, we've seen just an amazing environment where there's literally almost zero governance on the internet today, globally. And I'll give you a few statistics in just a minute, but they're actually stunning to see. And the governance model around the world, every domain is, uh, is fair game from a country point of view. And of course, with all the ubiquity of access that we have today, you can access any website in the world with a click of a button. And when you have a lack of governance model around the world with the internet, and you have all this privacy and anonymity, and you have all this innovation, it continues to just create the storm effect that we're seeing today. And one of the other variables that's amazing is naivete, as I call it, or lack of awareness to the problems that are happening. How many people read the Washington Post this morning on the Google hack? Anybody read that? Good. It's like right up there with homicides and hurricanes and twisters, unfortunately. And what we're seeing is, you know, an insensitivity to this problem at times. And it's amazing to watch almost every day the headlines have some sort of attack that's occurring on some side of corporation or government agency. And most of the Americans, most of the Western world, most of the Eastern world is not aware of the level of threats that we're visiting today or having in the world today. It's a pretty interesting problem when you have a lack of knowledge coupled with all the other variables. Then on top of all that, we have a significant deficit in defense models. Probably uh, the most interesting um, place right now is the, uh, the dislocation that we're seeing between offense and defense. I've never seen the gap be wider than we are seeing it today. And what I mean by that is if you think back over the last 25 years or so, when we first saw viruses in the wild, uh, some of you might remember Melissa viruses or I love you viruses or code red viruses. Hopefully I'm not dating myself too much here, but uh, you know, they were distributed on floppies and uh, what happened out of that? We created a, a business called antivirus. And the business of antivirus was all about looking for patterns uh, creating a signature, looking for attacks like the Melissa virus, and scanning for files that could be bad. And over the years, we created more and more signatures and more and more files to scan. More and more viruses came out. But what was interesting over the last 20 years or so, the offense and defense were pretty closely correlated, usually measured in you know, a few days, few weeks. But a signature could be generated because there wasn't that many of them, and it could be generated pretty quickly. So you were just slightly behind the curve. If you look at the last two, three years, the defense and the offense have been the greatest in dislocation, probably the history of, of internet, history of technology. Today we're seeing unprecedented amounts of attacks. We're seeing unprecedented amounts of, of information being stolen, as I mentioned. And the defense model today is completely broken, in my opinion. And uh, I liken it to the analogy, some of you probably know uh, the story between World War I and World War II of the Maginot Line. Everybody familiar with the Maginot Line? So here, the defense architecture that was built between World War I and World War II in the Ardennes Forest was all around this deep defense in depth architecture and the ability to create hundreds of miles of defense architecture to protect the, the French and German borders. And uh, of course, it took billions of dollars, especially in those days, to build many layers deep, chambers built to siphon out gas, launch airplanes, uh, be able to launch tanks, be able to launch artillery. And uh, it was probably one of the greatest defense models ever built, history of mankind. You all know the story, what happened. In days, weeks, the Germans were able to um, leverage air supremacy and blitzkrieg supremacy to get around that in, uh, almost instantaneously. So when you look at the defense models today in cyber, you have almost the same thing. Defense in depth at every level of the architecture is built with the exact same engine, antivirus, that's been built around for 25 years. All leveraging blacklisting and signature models. And now we have, in essence, over 60 million signatures in every single antivirus engine. And that engine sits on hosts like endpoints. 
It sits on network devices like firewalls and IPS solutions on email, on web. It sits on just about every area. And what's easy for the attackers to do is that if they can get past the blacklist, if they can get past the file scan, they've gotten past the entire defense architecture, just like that. So what are we seeing? Amazing statistics, absolutely stunning. And today, you know, you can see this, a $250 billion problem a year in theft of intellectual property. And quite frankly, in my opinion, that's uh, a very low number because the reported companies uh, who have breaches for intellectual property are pretty minute in the grand scale of the theft that's occurring. We have more than $114 billion a year of crime, of fraud, identity theft, and other types of, um, of crime activities. And this is also probably fractional of the real problem because when you actually look at what the attackers are doing in the world today, they're actually going after very specifically information from public companies so they can trade and hedge stock prices using inside information. Very hard to track that as a theft area. So what do we find? CFOs, controllers, finance managers as a number one target, particularly in Eastern Europe, where we're finding lots of attacks going after inside information and then trading on the capital markets on that information. So when you look in totality of the problem, it's probably measured in a trillion plus dollar a year problem, a year pretty amazing situation. We see 60,000 pieces of malware every day. 60,000 pieces of malware every day. The average company is infected 100 times a day. 100 times a day infected, actually successful infections on average. Every couple of seconds, there's an attack. Pretty interesting world. We see 9,000 new websites every day created that are malicious because of the lack of governance model. Pretty interesting. We have hundreds of thousands of command and control servers set up around the world. 94% of the countries in the world today are active with hosting command and control servers. So command and control servers are actually the ability to money launder intellectual property or information and, and, uh, and data. These servers are set up in nearly every country in the world, over 180 of them. So our problem has gone global. The problem is unbelievable in size and scope today. And it seems like it's only getting worse by the moment. When you look at the types of attacks that are happening today, these types of attacks are very ingenious. These aren't attacks where I simply send you an email with a file attachment like it once was. These attacks come down in stages. I'll send you one piece of information. I'll send you another one a month later, maybe even a year later. And over time, I'll download capabilities to your computing device that allow me to exploit the information on that computing device, what we call multi-stage. What else happens? They come down in multi-vectors. What does that mean? It comes through a number of different protocol points. I might send you an email with an executable, but it also has a web link in it. If I clip, click on the web link, I exercise a brand new protocol or a brand new vector. So the exploits are coming down in multiple ways today. And what happens is the lines of defense that have been architected in the world are lined up very deeply one protocol at a time. Very deep defense around email, very deep defense around web, very deep defense around file. But none of them correlate amongst each other. So the attackers use multiple vectors to attack the networks. So the architectures are completely flawed that we have today from a security point of view. And what's happening is the attacks become very, very present. We estimate more than 95% of all companies in America and the Western world are compromised as we speak here today. That's just the state of things. Somewhat ominous here this morning to say all that, but that's the truth and that's the reality of what we see. And quite frankly, 89% of those attacks are coming from China. Amazing statistic, 89% Chinese led. And we see that almost every day in our business, whether it's Mandian or FireEye or other security companies, we have some significant issues around the world in terms of the types of attacks that we're seeing and the types of threats that we're seeing. And the victims are everywhere, almost in every vertical. So it once was that the victims were focused in on particular high intellectual property verticals. Well, it's changed pretty dramatically. It's nearly every vertical and every size company today. 
If you have intellectual property, you're a target. We see it in hospitals and healthcare organizations. We obviously see it in banking. We see it in think tank organizations. We see it in manufacturing. We see it in energy. Almost every vertical and almost every country, we're seeing major exploits of information, intellectual property, and money around these industries. So it's gone global, it's gone vertical, and it's going from small companies to very large companies. So an interesting problem to, to solve and a difficult one to do. And many of you probably know some of the attacks, many of you might not, but when you look back on some of these major attacks, they're directly at the heart of the infrastructure stacks that are out there. Some of you might have heard of a, an operation called Aurora. This was made famous in 2010 by Google. And uh, this was uh, a specific target uh, using spear phishing that allowed a web exploit to download an MPEG that unpacked and then ultimately created a key logger so you could steal valid credentials. You could log back into the network using valid credentials and you could insert an advanced persistent threat, an APT. That advanced persistent threat could sit there for up to years and it could siphon out information. The Aurora attack was specifically after source code assets, a source code control system called Perforce. And it reached over 150 companies, especially high tech companies. So what do we see today from the threats? There are now zero days everywhere. Zero day attacks are attacks that are unknown to the vendor or the software company that actually has the product. So we're seeing zero days in Microsoft, Adobe, Java, just about every software stack that's out there on a regular basis. So interesting world going back to the types of attacks that are occurring and the types of attacks that are happening today. And the list goes on, Night Dragon, Shady Rat, B-Bus, Ghost Rat, I mean I can name them all. Almost every time we see major campaigns, major attacks on hundreds of companies at a time. So what are we gonna do about all this, right? It's a pretty big problem to solve and kind of a scary one, at least from my perspective. We, uh, we have a history where we've got a lot of challenges. Whenever a new domain is discovered, there's conflicts around that, whether it's land or air or seas or space, and now cyberspace, we've had conflicts. We need to resolve that. We need to figure out ways to address this as a global community. And I think about these in uh, kind of four letters. They all start with the letter T. I call them the four T's. But a uh, little tongue in cheek, but the idea here is we've got a number of fronts that we've got to improve upon in order to change the situation that we're in, in my opinion. The first T just would be called teamwork. And uh, it's an uh, it's, uh, often used word, but a very important word for us today. Uh, and the teamwork is needed across countries, public to public, uh, within public sector itself, governments then working together with governments. We need treaties around governments to uh, create an atmosphere in cyberspace that allows us to behave properly in the world today. The teamwork not, doesn't just need to exist between public and public, government and government, but it needs to exist government to private. So we need better interlocks between private sector and companies and security firms with the government. And we're making great progress in that area. That's encouraging to have, but we need a lot more of that and we need capabilities to share information, create safe harbors, protect public companies from liability around sharing that information. But the teamwork is critical, absolutely critical in my opinion. And we even look on private on private, companies working together, the security industry itself doesn't work effectively together. And we need to drive the security industry to work better together. I don't know how many of you have been to an RSA event. They're kind of fun to go to. RSA is one of the largest security shows in the world. 1,372 security companies showed up this year at the Moscone Center in February. And if you ask the 1,372 companies how many of them partner with each other, you might find it about zero or very small, especially when it's interoperability amongst sharing compromised data, sharing of intelligence using formats. And we need to create some formats that allow us to share better amongst the security industry. And there's some positive momentum that's happening there, like Open IOC from Mandiant or Styx that DHS is leading. But boy, do we have to take it to another level. That teamwork and that T is critical for us moving forward. The second T is around testing and standards and making sure that we test our architectures much better today. 
it's amazing to me to see all the vulnerabilities that are brought in in both imports and exports of technology, the lack of testing of these types of technologies. If you study the supply chain of technology today and that's being put into our critical infrastructure and you look at the testing that's done around it, you'd be appalled. Most of the, uh, the world's development for technology is done globally and of course the exploits can occur almost at any point in that supply chain of technology, yet we have very little standards for testing to implement critical infrastructure types of technologies. And we've done this in other areas. We have the ability to do testing, we have the ability to test these stacks to create standards around the infrastructure that we use. There's so many examples of this, everything from lighting that we see here today, like Underwriters Lab and UL, to power supplies, to just about anything else that you see today for seat belts to texting and driving. We have standards and testing that's done in every area that's dangerous in the world, yet we don't have them in the cyber world, we need them. The other areas are training, another T, education. I mentioned the naivete that we see in the world today with consumers and corporations, many of which don't even know they're breached, or if they are breached, they don't know what to do about it. The training is critical, the education is critical to help elevate the problem, to help them understand what to do, how to interact with law enforcement, how to interact with vendors and suppliers to solve these problems easier. And of course, when you look at it, less than 10% of the companies actually report that they've been breached. And if you look, almost 100%, nearly 100% of all companies that have been breached were notified by a third party that they were breached. They didn't know it themselves. So the education and training is critical to helping to solve this problem. The awareness level is critical. And the last T is technology. We have to advance the technology architectures that are out there today. There is some great technologies that are out there. I spent the last 10 years in the security industry and you can see some of the momentum that's being made architecturally but when you start to look at the standards that have been in place or the lack of standards that are in place, we have no impetus to try to put forth new technology that actually can stop some of the advanced threats that are out there today. There's some real promise of capabilities that we have in the architectures, models out there. The use of virtual machines or sandboxes or detonation chambers enable us to test web pages and applications prior to them being viewed on host computing. So instead of scanning and looking for bad files or patterns like signature antivirus is done, virtual machines can be used and leveraged in brand new ways at higher speeds and greater efficacy than we've ever seen today. But yet we're at our infancy of these types of technologies. And the ability to leverage them into all the egress points that we have in our architectures could advance these technology models uh, infinitely better than we have today whitelisting capabilities, gray listing capabilities, abilities to create interoperability amongst technology vendors could advance the T of technology in ways that we probably have never seen before. The technology exists today. We have to use it and leverage it. So hopefully I'll be standing here in another year or two and we'll be talking about how we've solved some of the problems that are out there. I think it's paramount that we do. I'm sorry if it came across a little ominous. I don't mean to. I'm a very, uh, very optimistic person by nature, but it's really interesting to watch what's happening out there in the world today. And uh, nearly every day at my companies, I see major exploits occurring, major countries attacking our infrastructure, and watching it happen at the, at the record paces is a little appalling to see. But uh, again, there's always a silver lining. There's always an optimistic view. And I think if we can all move forward as a community together, across public sector and private sector, we can solve these problems today. Thank you.